Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. My prop. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to Science on Tap. Um, my name's Susan Knight. I work at the University of Wisconsin Trout Lake Station. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea. The idea that was conceived in 1905 that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. And our partners in Science on Tap are Kemp Natural Resources Station, Trout Lake Station where I work, the Manaqua Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and um, of course our our, get our hosts here, the Manaqua Brewing Company, so thanks to all of them. And we are funded by a grant from the Brittingham Fund, so to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, so thanks to them as well. A reminder that there are four ways to watch. You can watch right here, like you all are doing tonight, which is great. We also have live streaming over at the Manaqua Public Library. And um, we also have live streaming so that you can watch anywhere that you have a decent enough um, internet connection so you can watch uh, live from wherever you are. And then finally, we, have, uh, we will archive this so that you can watch it later. If you're uh, too busy tonight or something, you, or you want to see um, some parts repeated, you can watch again uh, once we get them up online. And we also create a um, eight to 10 minute short version of this, a few minutes of introduction and a few minutes of questions. And uh, if you just want to get a kind of a flavor of what this is about. Okay, so speaking of recording, I have been instructed to instruct you that we have gotten word that our online patrons are having a very hard time hearing the questions. So please hold the microphone close to your mouth. It cannot be too close, Noah tells me. So put it right up there, and if you don't, Carol will shove it right in your mouth. All right? So. Get it good and close, none of this stuff, okay? Put it right up there uh, so that our online uh, listeners can hear your questions because they want to hear it. So um, anyway, and remember, if you ask a follow-up question, um, nobody can hear you unless you have the microphone. So raise your hand and Carol will bring the, the microphone back to you, okay? So in your face, hold the microphone even if you have a follow-up question, okay? So, our next event um, is January 8th, hard to believe. So, that is not the first Wednesday in January because the first, Janu first Wednesday in January would be January 1st. We figured maybe not too many people would come. So, um, it'll be January 8th. And um, so, um, and I have completely neglected to write down exactly who our speaker is, but he's talking about green energy. Noah, can I get a thumbs up on that? Yes, okay, I'm sorry, I, com I completely forgot to write down his name. So, um, but he's talking about green energy up here in the North Woods, so it should be uh, really uh, a great event. Um, tonight, we have Dr. PJ Leash. Uh, his real name is Patrick, he goes by PJ. He's a statewide entomology specialist within the UW-Madison Department of Entomology. His primary role is to serve as the director of the University of Wisconsin Insect Diagnostic Lab, where he handles approximately 2,500 insect identification requests every year. PJ also teaches on the UW-Madison campus, and he provides entomology-related outreach throughout the state, including regular appearances on Wisconsin's public radio. Many of you might have heard him on the Larry Mueller Show. Um, and Wisconsin is home to over 20,000 different insect species. And over a million are known from uh, around the planet, amazingly diverse, complex, and very interesting, fascinating creatures. Um, and Dr. Leach grew up in southeastern Wisconsin with four siblings. His interest in biology started early. He spent lots of time outdoors, uh, especially around a pond in his yard where he was fascinated by frogs and salamanders and grubs and worms and fireflies and just about anything creepy crawly. His family spent uh, summers in the North Woods as well. He said he has a, a house over by on Lake uh, Shishibagama. <coughs> and um, he had a summer job working with an entomologist looking for the invasive emerald ash borer, which unfortunately we know a lot about. Um, he'll probably tell us more. 
Uh, this led to his graduate work at UW-Madison studying May and June beetles. But they're May-June beetles, I learned, not May and June beetles, right? May-June beetles. All right, so he's been around Madison in the entomology department as a student and a staff member since 2007. So here is your trivia question for PJ. His first summer in Madison, PJ was living in his brother's studio apartment while his brother was away. Being a biologist, PJ had a number of live pets, including a critter named Wally. So just before he was leaving the apartment, Wally disappeared. PJ could not find him anywhere. But he was doing a really thorough job of cleaning the apartment because they wanted to get their, um, their deposit back. He still couldn't find Wally. He had pretty much given up when he was doing such a good job, he actually pulled out the refrigerator um, uh, to clean behind it, and there, snuggled up next to the compressor, was a snoozing Wally. What kind of a critter was Wally? All right, multiple choice. <laughs> the first one is a 24-inch baby boa constrictor. B, a foot-long giant African millipede. Or C, a 12-inch goliath bird-eating spider. Spider, snake, it was? E. The millipede. <laughs> uh. Uh. Well, pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, so, by the way, that was back in the day where you could just hop online and order foot-long millipedes off the internet. They've kind of cracked down on that these days, which if I had known about it, I probably would have stocked up and started a colony or something because uh, Wally, I thought she was adorable. My wife doesn't care a whole lot about insects. She thought Wally was adorable. So, uh, and we've been married about six years. So, uh, Wally was a wonderful pet. Uh, she lived for about, uh, I had her almost six years or so before she passed away. So some arthropods, insects and relatives can live a surprisingly long time. Uh, but that's what we're talking about tonight, insects and uh, their relatives, which are creatures that the famous ant expert, E.O. Wilson, once called the tiny things that run the world. Um, and once you start to learn about insects, uh, it really makes sense. They're amazingly diverse. You can find them in pretty much every spot on the globe. Uh, we have insects on every continent. There's a fly native to Antarctica, for example. Uh, about the only spots you don't find insects would be out in the middle of the ocean uh, and up at the North Pole where there's nothing but ice. But just about every other spot you look from the tops of mountains um, to you know, deep dark caves and, and places like that, you can find insects uh, if you go looking. In terms of their diversity, uh, if you were to make a list of animals on the planet, and we're really thorough and you listed all the animals known to science that list would be about one and a half million species long. Now, there's many species we haven't discovered yet, so that list is going to get longer over time. But of the 1.5 million animal species we know of, over a million of them are insects. So about 70 or so percent of the animals that we know of on the planet are insects. And, and so that's interesting to me. I bet if, if it were warmer outside, if we set up a booth at Torpy Park and asked folks to name 10 animals, I'm guessing we'd probably get very few insects on the list. We'd get dog, cat, fish, bird, you know, things of that nature. But numerically speaking, about seven or eight of the animals on that list should be insects or other arthropods. So they are the overwhelming majority, and yet they're so small that they often go uh, unnoticed. Furthermore, just to hit on insect uh, biodiversity, um, one group of insects in particular is so diverse, these would be the beetles, a group we call the order Coleoptera, they are so diverse that numerically speaking, one out of every four animals on the planet is a type of beetle. So think about that. Think about the animals that we maybe notice on an everyday basis. Again, dog, cat, you know, horse, cow, things like that. Numerically speaking, one out of every four animals we know of on the planet is a beetle of some kind. So that, it's mind-boggling when you start thinking about their diversity. Uh, and not only are insects amazingly diverse, uh, they do some really important things around the planet. And these are things that we perhaps take for granted. Um, driving up here uh, after deer season, 
saw quite a few deer on the side of the road. Something or someone's got to take care of those, and that often falls to insects. They are often nature's garbage men, if you will. They're, they're behind the scenes recyclers, breaking down organic materials that could be animal material, could be uh, decaying plants and things like that, but they play a really important role breaking down those materials, returning nutrients to the soil in other areas. So that's one really important thing that, that they can do, although it often goes underappreciated. Um, they're also very important predators and parasites. And when you start learning about predators and parasites that are insects, it's interesting and, and kind of cool to think of where the movie industry gets its inspiration for some of these, these sci-fi movies plots. Uh, and for example, there are a lot of insect parasites that we'd really refer to not as parasites, but as parasitoids. And then splitting some fine hairs here, a good parasite doesn't kill its host, because if the host dies, the parasite might die too. But there are lots of insects that are parasitoids, and a parasitoid does kill its host. So imagine you're an aphid. And if you know what aphids are, they're these little soft, squishy insects, feed on plants. Not that big, kind of plump, pear-shaped, maybe an eighth of an inch long. And along comes a teeny tiny little wasp. And this wasp is so small that if you were to see it flying, you'd probably refer to it as a gnat. You wouldn't even recognize that it's a wasp. It has no interest in stinging you whatsoever. Her goal is to inject her eggs inside that aphid. And her eggs are going to hatch and consume that aphid from the inside, killing it in the process. So that's a parasitoid. Now the thing is, there's lots and lots of insect parasitoids. Then you can have what's called a hyperparasitoid. This is an insect that's probably even smaller that is so specialized, its role in life is to parasitize the parasitoid. And then you could have a hyperhyperparasitoid and a hyperhyperhyperparasitoid, and it goes on and on. So it's like those wooden Russian dolls where you open them up and they're smaller and smaller inside. Um, so even though a moment ago I said the beetles were the biggest, most diverse group of insects that we know of, there's another group, the order Hymenoptera. These are very common. They're the ants and the bees and, and wasps and sawflies. Entomologists estimate that that group is probably actually bigger and more diverse than the beetles. It's just we haven't discovered the bulk of the species in that group. Taped to my office door in Madison, I've got a, a picture of one of the smallest wasps known to science and superimposed next to it are creatures from high school biology class, an amoeba and a paramecium. And if you remember those creatures, about the only thing I remember is they're single-celled organisms. And yet this wasp is the same size, it's a multicellular creature. It's got legs, it's got wings, it's got a brain, it's got a heart. I mean, it's amazing what insects can do. Um, so they've diversified. And again, we know of over a million, but there's probably three, four, five million more out there yet to be discovered. So there's new things we can find all the time. So as I said, they're important predators and parasites. They're also really important pollinators. If all the insect pollinators disappeared, you know, if we snapped our fingers and they disappeared, the grocery store would be a very different place. The produce section would essentially be gone. It turns out that about three quarters of all the plant crop species on the planet use insects as pollinators. And so these are the apples. We just had Thanksgiving, so the cranberries, the squash and pumpkins and things like that require insect pollinators. A lot of the things that we think about at the, the grocery store. But some of the things we might not think about right away, and these probably affect just about everyone in here, two foods that uh, require insects or insects are involved with their production, chocolate and coffee. Coffee plants are pollinated by bees and other insects. And then how many of you have bumped into no seums? No hands, so probably not a whole lot of fans in here of noceums. There's a relative of noceums that pollinates the cacao plant that we get chocolate from. So if those, if you could snap your fingers and the family of noceums disappeared, we'd run out of chocolate. And if the world runs out of chocolate and coffee, we're probably going to have a lot of grumpy people around, including myself. So insects can be important pollinators. Um, they also, very importantly, serve as the base of food webs. And this is another thing that we kind of intuitively know, but it goes underappreciated, I feel. Um, you know, lots of things feed on insects, birds, bats, and, and so on. And so the majority of vertebrates on the planet either directly feed on insects as, as their prey, or they're indirectly. You know, they may be eating something a little bit smaller than themselves that itself had fed on insects. So, Again, if all the insects were to disappear, I mean, life as we know it would just start collapsing 
because all the bigger things that eat insects and the bigger things that eat those, they're not going to have food. So they play a really important role in the ecosystem uh, as a base of food webs. But it turns out insects are facing tough times at the moment. If you hear the news on the radio or in the newspaper, we hear about insect declines. Um, and there's been a lot of recent research coming out in that regard. Uh, and it's a topic that's difficult to study because we know that insects and, and other creatures you know, vary from year to year. Populations are, of mosquitoes are up one year when it's really rainy, and if it's a dry drought year, perhaps they're down a little bit. So to really get a good picture of what's happening with insects, you need to watch them for long periods of time. We're talking 20, 30 years. And it's a little hard to go knocking on a funding agency's door and say, can I get a grant for 30 years? Normally, they're thinking, can we you know, have a project you can complete in two to five years, that sort of thing. So it's very difficult to, to study these. But that's what we're starting to see is there's declines going on. And we hear it for other groups of creatures too, birds and bats and things like that. So um, insects are facing tough times. Some of the factors involved with that include things like land use change. And I tell folks, if we could have a satellite view of Wisconsin today compared to 200 years ago, a lot has changed. You know, agriculture, uh, urbanization, deforestation, and things like that. Those are some of the big factors. Agricultural intensification, even 50 or 100 years ago, we had a lot of smaller farms, you know, smaller acreage where it was more of a patchwork in the landscape and you had a fence row here and weeds there and that sort of thing, whereas today it's larger monocultures, and that's having impacts on insects as well as pesticide uses, uh, changing climate. Things like light pollution, you know, it, it's something easy to do on your house. You know, add a few lights, you change the entire feel of the house, but it turns out nocturnal insects, that can have a significant impact on them, and we're starting to hear more about that. And then invasive species uh, are a challenge. At the Insect Diagnostic Lab at UW-Madison, it's a little bit alarming um, having my viewpoint because in a given year on average, I see two to three new non-native insects show up in the state every year. So that's in the span of a decade. That's 20 or 30 new invasive species. Now, some of those come in and they don't make much of a ripple at all. They might not have very significant impacts. They might kind of fizzle out and never become established. But every once in a while, we get the next emerald ash borer, the next gypsy moth, that uh, will have very, very significant impacts, um, both on uh, the ecosystem in terms of affecting plants, but also if they're out competing other native species, that's going to uh, play a role in insect declines as well. So the last thing I'd like to mention for my opening rep uh, remarks, what are a couple of simple things that you can do in your own yard? And I think everyone can do these to a certain extent. One of the best things I feel you can do is increase the diversity around you in the landscape. You know, put out a diversity of plants. A lot of insects are picky eaters. They may go to one type of plant or one type of plant genus or a plant family. So the more diversity we have in terms of the plants around us, we're going to be providing habitat for more of those insects. And that's a relatively easy thing to do. And if you really want to help out the pollinators, have uh, uh, plants with flowers on them. Um, that way we're providing nectar and pollen to those creatures. And uh, I like to go with native plants. Reason for that is our native insects are well adapted for those. Sometimes you go to a, a greenhouse and they've got these great flashy new flowers that might have been bred specifically to catch our attention, be visually appealing. Some of those flowers can actually have very little pollen or nectar. So we think we're helping out insects, but we're not providing them a whole lot of food. Some other things we can do, reducing or eliminating pesticide use in our yards. Or if you're going to use a pesticide, make sure to have a really good reason for it. And then lastly, I mentioned this a moment ago, but light pollution can affect insects. We know there's an awful lot of insects active at night. Some of them specifically like to come to lights at night, and we still don't fully understand why. But if we have those lights on all night, and they're hanging out by the light instead of mating and laying eggs and perpetuating their species, that's going to have some significant impacts on them. And there's also certain insects that don't necessarily like to come to light, but they like it to be really dark for them to be able to do their thing. And so if there's lights on all night and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, that's going to have some impacts on them at all. So those are my three things that I think we can all try to do in our yards to help out insects.
I have a question. I have a question about, can you hear me? Yes. About fungus gnats. About fungus gnats. Yes. Um, in the house, um, is there any way to get rid of them permanently? <laughs> <laughs> ah, so the question is about fungus gnats indoors. And if you're not familiar with fungus gnats, fungus gnats are these teeny tiny little dark colored flies. They don't hurt people at all, they're just kind of a nuisance. And indoors, in the vast majority of cases, they're associated with indoor plants. So do you have any indoor plants in this case? I have a Meyer lemon tree, and I think that's how I brought them in, because I had it outside and brought it in. And okay. I... okay. So the story with fungus gnats is the juvenile stage, the larvae like to live in damp organic material. They basically feed on stuff like rotting leaves, uh, soil that is rich with organic materials and things like that. So if I wanted to go find fungus gnats outside, I'd go to a, a compost pile, a rotting log, or something like that. So indoors, what that might suggest to me is perhaps the soil is a little bit on the damp side for the, the, the particular plant. If that happens, and we've got damp conditions and decaying leaves and stuff like that, that may be food for them. So one option, if the plant can tolerate it, is watering less frequently and kind of drying that soil out more. That can be really helpful in that regard. Um, I have had some indoor plants in my office on campus where that's all I did is over the course of about a, a month and a half was water less frequently, and that creates conditions that are really inhospitable for the larvae to survive. So that's one option. It's a completely chemical-free way to deal with them. Another option, if you go to the hardware store or garden center, you can buy what are called sticky card traps or, or glue card traps, and they look like a yellow index card, they usually come with some stakes, and, and you can put those in the pot. The adult flies are attracted to the color to a certain extent, so they, they bump into it, they get stuck in the glue that's on there. That may be a way to kind of siphon some of them off the population. That alone probably won't wipe them out, but often between drying down the plant and also using the sticky cards, that can be very, very helpful. Okay, I'm, I've been trying all, pretty much all those things. Okay. And the lemon tree is down to like about three leaves okay. again. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. And, and I don't, are they eating the roots? I don't think of them as really being plant feeders. Um, if you dig into the literature on greenhouse plants, if you had very high populations of them, they might nibble just a little bit. Otherwise, I think of them as more being scavengers that are just feeding on organic material in the soil. So uh, I don't think they would necessarily be causing harm to the, the plant roots itself. Hmm. Okay. What, one other option along those lines. Um, so there's actually a, an organic type product. So if you have heard of BT, BT is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a, a bacteria that happens to have insecticidal properties. Um, there are different types of BT. So if you go to the hardware store, you can usually find BTK, Bacillus thuringiensis kerstachii. That's a strain of BT that only kills caterpillars, so that wouldn't work in this case. But if you go online, you can find some products that contain BTI, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis, and that one works against the larvae of flies. And so it's more of a natural type product because it's this bacteria there's a product out there called Natrol, G-N-A-T-R-O-L. I would maybe do some Google searching for that. That is something that greenhouse owners, for example, will use, apply it to the soil to help control uh, fungus gnats if they have really significant issues with them. I try to have a diverse population of plants. What plants can I grow or insects I can introduce that will kill mosquitoes? Mosquitoes. Oh, good question. Um, and that's a common question I get. What plant can I put in my yard to make all the mosquitoes and make all the flies and make everything else go away? Uh, and to be honest, I don't know of any plants that you can just put in. Uh, often when I see articles, it's things like lavender plants and mint plants, things that we think of, of having uh, you know, a scent associated with them, but I just haven't seen any research to back up that you put in plant A or B and it gets rid of the mosquitoes. There's a hint of truth to it in that some of those plants, if you were to grind up the leaves and extract the essential oils, those may have some degree of repellency 
towards mosquitoes or other insects, usually fairly short-lived, but again, just plopping the plants in the ground doesn't really do anything to help repel or kill mosquitoes. And what about competing insects that might eat the mosquitoes? Uh, so for things that would eat mosquitoes, um, some of the things that come to mind would be perhaps some of our, our spiders, which we have no shortage of spiders up here in the North Woods. Um, otherwise, because it, you have to understand the, you know, the life cycle of mosquitoes, the larvae are developing in, in bodies of water. So then we're thinking more along the lines of aquatic insects that might be predators and, and feeding on those. And those are going to be difficult to, to change the populations of. It's not like we can drive to a store and order a batch of dragonfly larvae to add. Um, so that, that's kind of difficult to do. There are, of course, plenty of, of predatory insects out there. Some of these you can purchase. There's various lady beetles and lacewings and things like that. But in general, I think of those as, as being much better predators of insects that have limited mobility on plants, like aphids and things like that. So off the top of my head, I don't know of any insects you can just purchase online that you can release that are going to go out and, and wipe out all the insects in your yard, unfortunately. Uh, Susan mentioned earlier about the emerald ash borer. Or is there any cure um, in sight for that? Yeah, so great question. Uh, and, and emerald ash borer, as you heard, you know, I got involved with it early on. That was kind of my, my gateway bug, if you will. That got me into entomology. Um, that was back in about 2005 or six. So it's going on 15 years that I've worked with that insect or one way or another. Um, in terms of what's in store for the state, um, and it's interesting because up here in the North Woods, we still have about 20 counties that haven't detected it yet. So southeastern Wisconsin, if you drive through Milwaukee, there's dead ash trees left and right. It's bad down there. Um, unfortunately, over time, you know, that insect is going to continue to spread its way around the state. If you look at the map on the DATCAP, or Department of Ag, website, uh, it's about a quarter of the, the municipalities in the state have seen emerald ash borer yet, meaning three-quarters of the state in that regard have not seen this insect. In terms of what is potentially being done, uh, there are some efforts uh, along the lines of plant breeding, looking at ash trees that have survived attack by emerald ash borer. And we've seen evidence of that in, in places like Michigan, where emerald ash borer has gone through an area, killed the majority of the trees, and there are some trees that show signs of being attacked, and yet they survived. So perhaps they have a genetic mutation, better plant defenses, Maybe they're less detectable to the insect. We don't fully know at this point. But folks are surveying those trees, and, and perhaps a long-term goal would be to take those trees that aren't killed by emerald ash borer and breed some type of, of hardier tree that then could be um, planted to you know, ensure that the ash trees aren't going to all get wiped out. So that's one approach. Uh, another option, and I talked along these lines a, a little bit earlier, with biological controls. And I mentioned the, the influence for sci-fi movies where we have these parasitoids. It, it's kind of like the movie Aliens, where they're sitting around and the creature bursts out of their chest. I mean, that's what these parasitoids do. And scientists have imported a number of these from Eastern Asia where emerald ash borer is, is native. So they, they went over there, they identified these parasitoids. Then they had to quarantine them in a lab for a long time just to make sure they were really specific. Because the last thing they would want to do is release these parasitoids and find out two years later they're killing monarchs or honeybees or something like that. And based on their experiments, they tried getting these insects to attack very closely related insects, and they basically wouldn't do it. So their conclusion was these parasitoids, it's like a lock and key. They really only go to emerald ash borer. So over the last five to 10 or so years, there have been releases of these around the country. Uh, including here in Wisconsin. We are seeing some evidence that um, they are making it through the winters and, and reproducing, but we're still relatively early in the ball game. We don't know what's that magical critical mass we need to hit before they start really knocking down emerald ash borer. So that's kind of the long-term game plan at this point, is putting efforts into those biocontrol releases uh, the USDA has uh, some facilities where they specifically rear these insects, and there are three species of tiny 
minuscule wasps that are maybe uh, two to three millimeters long or so. There are two species that specifically target the larvae of emerald ash borer, and one species of wasps that specifically targets the eggs of emerald ash borer. So that's kind of our long-term game plan is, is keep releasing those and hoping that eventually they'll turn the tide on, on that insect. Um, in your opinion, what, what's the uh, major reason for the great reduction in bee populations? Bee populations. So uh, kind of tying in with what I mentioned in my opening remarks about insect declines. And, and my main message is that there isn't one single cause. Um, if that were the case, I tell folks, we can go to the wall and flip that one switch in the other direction and correct the issue. Instead, with bees, it's multiple interacting factors. And each factor might have a tiny influence, but you start adding these up on top of one another, and that, uh, I think, is causing some of the major declines. And when you look at the review papers on the topic, that's what they conclude, essentially. It's a lot of these interacting factors. So it's some of the things I mentioned already, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, urbanization, deforestation, pesticide use, either causing a, acute impacts, you know, death on the spot, or sometimes subtle impacts that maybe aren't killing a bee directly, but maybe they make it more susceptible to a, a disease pathogen, and then they ultimately become sick because of that. With things like honeybees, for example, there are a lot of pathogens and parasites that can impact them. If you're a honey beekeeper, um, one of the most important things you have to keep an eye out for is a, a parasite called the varroa mite, which uh, it's a parasitic mite. If I had a varroa mite on me, if I were a honeybee, it would be like having a tick this size on me. I mean, they're, they're pretty big in comparison to the size of the honeybee, and a honeybee could have potentially a, a couple of those on them. So they're trying to fly around and forage, carrying this extra weight, but those same mites can also carry and transmit diseases, like some of the viruses. And honeybees can come down sick with over two dozen different viruses that we know of at this point. So again, it's not one individual factor. It's all these things tying together, and it's extremely difficult to tease out those subtle effects that each individual factor plays in the game. Thank you. Oh, oh OK. So I have a question about tent caterpillars. Can you describe uh, their behaviors and also where they are most dense and, and, and a little bit about their life cycle, why we see them some years and why we don't see them for several years, okay. et cetera? Thank you. Sure. So I think in this case you're probably referring to the forest tent caterpillars, the ones we get the big outbreaks of in, in this part of the state. And you can find them statewide. Um, they feed on a very wide range of uh, hardwood trees. Some of their favorites include things like aspens, alders, but they'll feed on a, a number of different things. But I feel we see more of them up in this part of the state because we have a lot more wooded area. In terms of why you see them some years and, and some years you don't, um, we do know they can go through some long-term cycles, and there's a lot of things involved with that. Um, it can be partly weather conditions. You know, if it's really too rainy, they can come down sick with diseases, for example. If the conditions are just right, their numbers are probably going to creep up. There's also a lot of predators and, and parasites, for example, that maybe the tent caterpillars start building up their population over a couple years, well, in the meantime, the good guys are slowly creeping up their numbers as well. And once they catch up, you know, all of a sudden their numbers crash off, and then we have it relatively low for several years. Now, for forest tent caterpillars in the state, it has been quite a while since we've had a really big outbreak. Um, historically, it's often something we'd see about once a decade or so, where it might get the, the huge numbers where they're coating highways and roads get slippery and things like that. So in that regard, you know, are we potentially overdue? Hard to tell. Um, but again, if, if the conditions, weather and parasites and predators are doing their part to keep them in check, their numbers could also potentially stay low for a while. So sometimes there's a, a little bit of an unknown in terms of when exactly will they pop up again next. Uh, the last few years in the area, you see these small signs uh, about mosquito treatment, either our yards being treated or this is a service that's available, and I, I don't know if 
the average consumer is thinking, oh, it only kills mosquitoes. Uh, are you aware of what toxins are used and how much training the people are getting and is this stuff bad in the, in the lakes, streams, and so forth? Right. Yeah, so it's interesting. Over dinner, we were chatting about um, some of the mosquito treatments. Often the mosquito treatments, um, the, the chemicals that are used belong to a group we call the synthetic pyrethroids. The natural version, which we call the pyrethrins, is an extract from certain types of chrysanthemums. The natural extract tends to break down extremely rapidly in sunlight and UV light, things like that. So chemists kind of tweaked the molecules, made them more photostable so they might last a week or two, potentially longer. Depends on the individual active ingredient, the chemical in that product, how the product is formulated and so on. The thing is about the pyrethroids, they're very broad spectrum in terms of what they can potentially kill. If you go to the hardware store and look at the, the wall of wasp sprays and stuff like that, the things available to homeowners, probably 90-ish percent of those are going to be these pyrethroid insecticides. We can use them outdoors, we can use them indoors for various uses. So they can control a very wide range of, of insect pests. What I haven't seen is a whole lot of research in terms of what other potential side effects of these mosquito treatments. And I have some concerns with them when I think about it. If they can kill all these other insects that are pests, you know, what impacts are they having on you know, bees and other things in our yard? Uh, some research I have seen uh, in our uh, Department of Entomology at UW-Madison, we have a, a world expert on monarch butterflies, uh, Karen Oberhauser. She has done some work um, with some of these mosquito-type treatments with monarch caterpillars and so found some impacts there. So I would love to have a, a team of students look at something like that, do a simulated mosquito treatment, and then a day or three or five or seven days later, put out some beneficial insects on those treated plants and see what happens to them because I've got a bad feeling that those products may be having negative impacts on those. So when I look at the bigger picture, I mean, especially up here in the North Woods, we've got an awful lot of water around. We're going to have mosquitoes up here. Uh, is treating your one yard really going to stop them entirely? And on a short-term basis, it might. But if you're having your yard sprayed every other week, you know, twice a month, something like that, you know, what are the side effects? And I just haven't seen research, you know, showing one way or another what those side effects are. Uh, first, a comment for the lady with the Meyer lemon tree. Um, a non-chemical way to deal a little bit, at least, with um, indoor bugs is to get a couple of carnivorous plants as buddies. <laughs> <laughs> the, some of the florists in the area have used that as a means of controlling it. Uh, my question is, um, what are your thoughts or opinions about the use of mycelial honey to treat colony collapse for honeybees? Oh, that's a, a good question. And to be honest, you know, I, I've heard of that approach. I just don't know a whole lot about it to, to you know, chat about it at this point. So I, I don't have much an opinion either way. I'd have to do some, some serious reading on that. What are the common freeze-tolerant insects that we can look for in the woods up here now? Oh, all kinds of goodies. Um, so when it comes to, to insects during the winter months, um, the majority of our insects are dormant or some of them die off. We do have some that can be active during cold days, although if you want to find them, um, like out in the snow, you'd have to go out on a relatively calm winter day. So if, if it's 10 degrees, it's too cold. You'd want it to be 25 to maybe 35. If it's sunny, that's great. Those are some good conditions for going out and, and finding insects on the snow in winter. We've got a, quite a few different ones. Uh, there's some wingless crane flies, for example. Um, we have some creatures called winter scorpion flies, which are bizarre, quirky creatures um, that you can find uh, on snow surface. There are certain types of spiders, for example. I was up in the North Woods last year, and New Year's Eve, we were skiing around um, in a marshy area, and there were just these spiders very lethargically walking across the snow. Um, there are types of springtails, which we commonly call snow fleas. Um, they look like little jumping flakes of pepper. Those can be very common as well. If it's just above freezing, there are some of the, the brown lace wings that I've bumped into during the winter months. So again, if, if it's just warm enough, right around freezing or just above that, especially if you have maybe a little bit of open water from a stream or something like that, 
you'd be surprised at how many different things you can find out in active. Um, we have traps around our goat fence, mm -hmm. and and they're for and they're for flies. They kill the flies, but not only the flies, but other beetles like rove beetles and other insects that will kill the flies and the rove beetles and other insects that will kill the flies are dying. Mm -hmm. So I want to, so can you, uh, can you say to me, like, what kind of traps we could use or predators we can use to um, kill the flies instead of just other insects? Sure. So I, I guess part of me would be curious to see what type of traps you have set up. Um, if you are trapping, for example, are, are these flies that are biting the goats? Yes. Okay. So uh, along those lines, I mean, then I'm starting to think of things like stable flies and, and some of the horse and deer flies. Um, if you have a trap that functions essentially like a flight intercept trap, so they, they fly into it and maybe fall into a bucket, is, is that what's going on in this case? No, they we put like a little stinky bag in there or okay. maybe some fish guts, and okay, and um, they'll actually like walk on one of the doors of the trap, and they're and they're very attracted to it. They want it. Okay. And then they think, oh, I I'm I'm gonna eat this like fish guts or something, you know, and then they like fall into the trap and then they die. Okay. Okay, gotcha, thanks. That helps out quite a bit. So I think in that case, what may be going on is the rove beetles, and, and you kind of mentioned this as well, some of those species that may be predators and, and once in a while, they may just be going to the, the dead fish guts and things like that because they'll scavenge on those types of materials as well. There's a lot of rove beetles that will go to, to dead animals and roadkill and stuff like that. So I would wonder if you changed trap types and a lot of biting flies tend to be attracted to dark colored moving objects. So there are some fly traps where it basically looks like a big beach ball that's black and they cover it with really sticky material. And if that's swinging around, the fly may think, hey, that's a goat, I'm gonna fly to that and get stuck on it. So that's one thing that you could try and because you won't have the fish guts in the trap, I suspect it would be less attractive to the rove beetles and other potential beneficial predatory insects. So that's something that you could try. Thank you. I feel like I gotta stand because there's Christmas trees right here. <laughs> um, first of all, I appreciate this conversation. I think we have to have it more in our community and as a whole. Um, the bugs make the world go round. Um, I am a beekeeper. I also am a big mushroom hunter, and I really appreciate the comment brought, and I, I feel like i got to bring that back to the table. Um, since it is such new research, it would be a good opportunity to share with the public that there might be some opportunity to connect with your mycelium interest people to see the relationship mm -hmm. between mushrooms, um, particularly the polypore mushroom that fights off these bacterias and viruses that can kill our bugs, but more importantly, our pollinators, and even more importantly, our honeybee that I would fear in my lifetime would go um, on the um, endangered species list. Mm -hmm. So um, as being just a citizen, I'm asking you um, in the Madison UW system, what exactly has come to your table? And what exactly is your perspective on researching that opportunity at finding the relationship between uh, mushrooms and bugs? And if we can help stop these viruses and bacteria based on that relationship that we just have recognized um, saves each other. Sure. Yeah, so I, I definitely think it's an, an interesting topic, an important topic, uh, and that's one thing that folks are starting to take a much closer look at. I mean, insects are small, so they're hard to study as is, and then you start looking at the microbes, and you've got you know, bad microbes and good microbes, and how are they essentially going to, to duke it out? So I, I think it's very important research that needs to be done. 
Uh, in terms of, of folks that do that, um, there are researchers around the country that study honeybee health, of, of course. Uh, I don't know of any off the top of my head specifically studying the mycelial interactions. I mean, someone that might come to mind would be like Marla Spivak, University of uh, Minnesota. She does a lot to study uh, bee health and hygienic lines and, and ways that we can you know, help out bees um, kind of be able to defend themselves better. Um, so that might be uh, someone that could potentially be reached out to and see if she has any interest. Uh, in terms of you know, researchers at UW-Madison, we have a couple folks uh, working with Honeybees, to a certain extent, um, have a number of folks working with bumblebees at the moment. It kind of depends on individual research interests in a given lab. We used to have, for example, many years ago, we were blessed with a, a USDA honeybee research facility in Madison, and that has since moved on. But gosh, if we still had a facility like that that could start looking at these types of questions, that would be great. Because as I said, I, I've heard a little bit about it. I'd love to hear more and see, you know, are there some options there that might be, uh, might be good to have on the table. One question yes, a question online. Um, are there any studies occurring in Wisconsin looking at decreases in diversity and biomass of insects? Yeah, good question. Um, I can't think of anything specifically uh, at the moment. Um, we have uh, folks in our department, for example, that are um, some are working with bumblebees, and, and we do know of bee declines, and, and I have colleagues uh, surveying for things like monarchs and, and bumblebee numbers and that sort of thing. Um, it's tough, though, when you look at the studies that have come out looking at overall catch mass and diversity and things like that, um, it's very difficult to get funding to do that type of work and, and to get accurate um, results where you can really tease out that trend from all the noise you need to look at long periods of time. So there was a really good study that came out of Germany within the last two years or so, and basically it was a, an amateur entomological society, and they designed this experiment to be exactly the same in many of these different spots, and they did the exact same type of trapping for about 30 years. And so that's the type of efforts that would really need to be done to definitively say what's going on. However, at the same time, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that we see, and it's, it's hard to really quantify that, but it is scary. Um, one of the, the things I very commonly hear is what I'd refer to as the windshield effect. Folks say, I used to drive up from southern Wisconsin to the north woods, and I'd have to stop and squeegee off my windshield twice, and now they come up here, and they never have to do that. So we have that type of information. But again, it's very hard to really document that. But um, I feel that myself and, and many other entomologists are starting to see, and we're getting more and more papers that are pointing to not just you know, North America, but spots around the globe where we are seeing these declines that have just started popping up in really intense fashion in about the last 50 to 70 years, since about the 1950s. And if you think about what's happened during that time in terms of world population, uh, intensification of agriculture and things like that. I mean, there's a lot going on. Um, so it, it's really kind of scary when you think about these insect declines because sometimes it's, it's pretty high percentages of insects that seem to be declining. Uh, my question was, uh, can you comment on the use of neonicotinoids in agriculture? Um, what, how do they work? Uh, what are the indications for them? And are the side effects on the environment so bad you think they should be banned? Yeah. So uh, in terms of neonicotinoids, so, so neonicotinoids are something that came out on the market about 20 to 30-ish years ago. And a reason for them is when you look at the acute toxicological effects, you know, they can test it in a lab and see, is it toxic to mammals such as mice or rats or rabbits or things like that? Um, they were finding that those neonicotinoids were favorable in that regard and that they were less toxic to mammals than some of the old insecticides, organophosphates and things, that some of them are still around, but most have been phased out, and the other ones are kind of heading in that direction. These are things like chlorpyrifos and, and things of that nature. So when you look at that picture, yes, they're less toxic. Folks also looked at them and said, well, they can move within plants, so that's kind of nice. We don't have to spend the fuel cost 
driving through our field to spray it and maybe running over some plants in the process, if we can put that seed in the ground and it's got the treatment on it already and it's going to grow and move up in the plant, you know, that's fairly slick technology in that regard when you think about it. However, they are insecticides. I mean, they're designed to kill insects. Now, each insecticide and every pesticide has its own personality, if you will. Some are very effective, but maybe only effective against one group of insects. Some of them can affect a broad range of things. The neonicotinoids in particular, they happen to be highly toxic to bees, which is scary. Um, and they were adapted uh, and used in agriculture, you know, zero to 60. They went from being almost non-existent um, to, you know, very widely planted in the span of about a decade or so. So that's scary. Um, we do have concerns, of course, with bees. But we're also starting to find out that these things are, are just in the environment and they're probably affecting other things. Uh, I recently read an article, I believe it was from the National Geographic website, that looked at some of these neonicotinoid treatments on birds, uh, migrating songbirds. And they were finding that if birds were migrating through an area in spring where farmers were using these seed treatment types and some of the dust drifts off and the birds get real world contact, it was having impacts on the birds, wasn't it? you know, causing them to drop dead, but maybe they're not eating as much, and that's going to slow down their migration route. So the more studies that are done, we're starting to find more and more about these side effects on what they're doing to insects, um, what they're doing to other organisms, be it birds or fish or things like that. So there's a lot of bad news coming out about that neonicotinoid group. Um, yeah, so I have a question about an insect that is not on the decline, but is on the rise, the wood <laughs> the tick or the deer tick, the wood tick, um, why do we need them? And who are their <laughs> predators? And do they do good in the woods? Yeah. And is there a bacteria or a virus or a, a, anything that can kind of control their populations? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. I'm really glad you brought up that topic. I was hoping it would pop up. Um, so ticks are interesting, and I, I mentioned earlier insects do really important things. They're beneficial predators, base of food webs, uh, recyclers, and things like that. For me, gosh, it's hard to make a good case for why we should have ticks around. Um, I mean, they transmit diseases. I can't think of any animal that specifically incorporates ticks as a really high percentage of their diet, for example. Um, now, what's, what's interesting to me, though, is when you look at ticks, um, we are really watching an emerging health threat. And what I mean by that is we didn't find our first deer tick in the state until about the late 1960s. So this has only been going on in the last 50 years. So our grandparents didn't have to deal with deer ticks when they were growing up. Um, if you were in the 1950s or 1960s, if you wanted to find deer ticks, you had to go to places like Texas to find them. We just didn't have them here because it's that big darn ice sheet 10,000 years ago squished them all and you know, got rid of a, a lot of things in the state. So again, it, it's a relatively new thing, and uh, we still don't know where they're going to stop because they're still expanding the range into new spots in the state where we haven't seen them yet. So that's really scary uh, in that regard. And then when I think of the human health impacts of uh, ticks, I'm a lot more uh, afraid of ticks than I am of mosquitoes. We hear in the news about Zika virus, and this year it was Eastern equine encephalitis and things like that. Those are relatively small numbers of cases of those compared to ticks, where there's thousands of folks that get Lyme disease every year, for example. So those are, are really scary numbers. Uh, at the moment for uh, Lyme disease in deer ticks, about 20-ish percent of the juvenile ticks, the, the nymphs are carrying uh, Borrelia that uh, can cause Lyme disease. And then for the adults, it's somewhere in the ballpark of about 40-ish percent. And th this can vary throughout the state. There's some spots that it may be higher, closer to 60% of the adults, but that's almost a coin flip if you get bitten by a, a deer tick adult, if it's got Lyme or not. So those are some really scary t statistics. Then there's other diseases, and we're starting to see new ticks emerge as well. Uh, there's one tick in particular I have on my radar that we haven't seen in Wisconsin yet. It's called the Asian longhorn tick. And this is one that showed up out east. I believe it was first spotted in New Jersey, if I remember correctly. But out in the eastern U.S. a couple of years ago, and it has now spread to uh, over half a dozen states as far west as there is a detection in Arkansas, I believe. 
And what's scary about that tick is in its native range, it can carry a, a virus that can be lethal to humans. And what really is scary to me is it can reproduce by parthenogenesis, meaning the females can basically clone themselves. So you could have one female tick brought in, start a new population of that particular tick. So when it comes to you know, things that keep me up at night, it would be ticks. And as I said before, it's, it's hard for me to find some good reasons for why we would want ticks around. From their point of view, they're just trying to perpetuate their species. They seem to be doing a really good job at it lately, though. And so that's why it's really important, especially up here where we have lots of good tick habitat, to be taking the precautions, the long sleeves, the repellents, and, and things of that nature. Yeah, returning to the Bt delta endotoxin. So widespread and intensive agricultural use of, let's say, Bt corn. Yes. Has resistance reared its ugly head yet? And if so, how bad is it? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. So we have seen some cases of resistance. It depends on the individual pests and the different types of Bt proteins being used. The best example of resistance that uh, farmers have to fight with at the moment, for example, would be a type of beetle larvae called the corn rootworm. And if you're a corn farmer in the state, that's your biggest threat potentially to your corn crops. And so it's like running on a treadmill. They've got to keep changing these just to try and stay one step ahead of that insect because it seems to be able to develop resistance fairly quickly. For some of the other pests we see in, in agricultural crops like corn, some of the caterpillar pests, um, take European corn borer, for example. If we went back 70 years ago, European corn borer was a key agricultural pest in the state. Today, it's very rarely seen in comparison because the BT has been very effective. We just haven't seen the resistance issue. So each insect varies in terms of how readily resistance can pop up. So that kind of complicates it, it further. So some cases, resistance definitely has occurred. In other cases, the BT crop seem to be working fairly well against some of the pests. We've had several questions. Hang on a second. Let me <laughs> line them up. Um, whoa, whoa. Here we go. Um, how is climate change influencing the insect populations? Yeah, another good question. So that was one of the things that uh, is being implicated in insect declines. Um, the thing is with climate change, we know it's very difficult to measure because it's a, a global phenomenon. Um, there undoubtedly will be some impacts on insects. That may be um, indirect if we have a, a shift in where their host plants can live. You know, if those uh, plants are, need to shift northward to survive, but maybe that can occur quickly enough for that habitat to move, well, then the insects that rely on those plants may die out. So there's probably going to be some impacts like that. If you went to a place like the tropics, where biodiversity is at its highest on the planet, you can have an amazing breadth of diversity in a small area, especially if there's mountains involved because your habitat at one elevation could be very, very different than even 100 or 200 meters up the slope. So if temperatures are changing, you know, you're forcing those insects and plants and other creatures to try and perhaps creep higher up on the mountain. Well, if you're at the top, you've got nowhere to go. So one analogy I've heard is it's basically like islands, essentially. And if that habitat disappears, they have nowhere else to go. So it, it's undoubtedly going to have impacts. It's just very difficult to measure in some cases. Yeah, I have a couple of small gardens and I grow potatoes and I've stopped trying to control the Colorado potato beetle. And what I do is I play a game of uh, hide and seek. I move my potato plants around and a couple of years later, the Colorado potato beetles find them. And you know, I did some reading on the beetles and you know, that's kind of a super bug right now. They're, they're resistant to a lot of different pesticides. And, um, and I was thinking more about insect populations. And uh, many of what insects that we consider to be pests were at one time innocuous. And we set the table for them with huge populations of their host plant. We kill their, their predators. But also, they, they seem to evolve very quickly, some of these insects. We think about evolution. You know, most of us think that takes millions of years or eons. When it comes to insects, evolution can go really, really fast. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering about some of these insects that we consider pests. Are they unique because they can evolve quicker than other insects? 
or are they just pests because we've just set the table for them and we killed our predators? Well, it, it may be some of both of those. Um, in, in some cases, you know, you might have an insect that feeds on some type of native plant, and then all of a sudden humans start planting a crop closely related to it, and they jump onto that crop and they say, hey, this is even tastier than the wild stuff we were feeding on. So that is essentially what had happened to a certain extent with like Colorado potato beetle. Um, and then if we keep planting that same crop in the same spot every year and more and more of it, we're just you know, giving them a smorgasbord of, of what they want. Uh, in some cases, though, like with the Colorado potato beetle, they are genetically, they've got the, the, the genetic tools there to develop resistance pretty quickly. And so that can be really, really challenging for it. Um, but there's a, a lot of insects that, uh, you know, that can happen for, where if the conditions are just right, we give them exactly what they want, they can go from being a, a minor insignificant pest to all of a sudden being a, a major insect pest for us. Yeah, um, what do you think about tubes that you can put around your yard to kill ticks? They fill them with um, uh, cotton that is soaked with permethrin, yes. and the rodents line their nests with them, and they kill the nymphs. Yes. Tick tubes. Yep, yeah, so they're called tick tubes, and I think there's another uh, brand name on the market as well, and as he said, they're, they're basically a cardboard tube about this big inside of some cotton balls treated with permethrin, and the thought with that approach is rather than going out and spraying a broad spectrum insecticide to a larger area. Let's get the rodents to come in, use the nesting material, and they're gonna brush up against it, and if, if ticks are contacting them, we'll kill the ticks on the animal. So it's a route to get more directly uh, at the ticks on the host. Uh, there's been some research that has come out in the last year or so. Uh, it's not gonna completely take ticks out of your yard, but that's an option that folks can do, especially if you are in like somewhere up here in the North Woods and you know you have a yard with a lot of ticks. I, of course, in a case like that, would be using personal protection, the repellents, the long sleeves, and that sort of thing. But putting out those tick tubes may be a supplemental way to help in your yard. And again, it, it's gonna minimize overall insecticide use. Uh, still on ticks. Yes. Are they found all over the world and the spray that you can use on your shoes and like lower pant legs, do you think that's effective? Yes. Um, so first of all, ticks, where are they found? You can find ticks pretty much around the planet. Actually, if you want to go to the hot spot of tick biodiversity, you'd probably want to go to Africa. They've got very, very specialized tick species. Um, we actually have a, a researcher on campus at UW-Madison that had done some field work there um, he came back, found out he had a tick up his nose, and it was a new species known to science. It turns out it was a tick that its habit was to go after primates and get to spots where it couldn't easily be removed. So if you want tick biodiversity hotspot, go to Africa. They've got some uh, really cool looking species. There's a tick, I believe it's on uh, rhinoceros, that has got some cool patterns on it. So they've got a lot more species uh, than we do here. Uh, in terms of the clothing treatment, that is a very, very effective way. Um, and that's something that if I were going to be spending a lot of time outdoors, be something I would consider. The product contains permethrin. Um, it's the same product we just talked about with the tick tubes. Permethrin itself is occasionally used in uh, veterinary medicine, sometimes in human medicine for scabies and, and some of the head lao shampoos. Um, so it, it's generally fairly safe for humans. Um, the way these types of treatments would work, you wouldn't stand and, and spritz it on yourself. You'd take off you know, your pants or have your whatever pair of uh, pants or jacket or boots you want to treat, and you usually get a little bottle like this that can have enough material to treat an outfit, and you apply it on there following directions. You wait for it to dry, and then that product is going to work on there usually through multiple washings, and it can do a couple of things. The first thing is that it does have insecticidal properties. So if the ticks contact it long enough, it will actually kill them outright. The other thing is it can have uh, repellent properties because it irritates the ticks when they touch it. So some research has looked at those promethean treatments, found out that they can be very, very effective um, in terms of preventing tick uh, encounters. Yeah, uh, 
question. Um, other than foot-long millipedes, what is your favorite arthropod? Ooh, favorite arthropod. Okay. <laughs> um, my favorite arthropod would probably be an insect. Uh, it's one that personally I have gone out looking for. I have never seen it myself in the wild. Um, these are creatures called ice crawlers. And despite, you know, Lambeau Field is supposedly the frozen tundra, we don't have ice crawlers in Wisconsin. If you want to find ice crawlers, you have to go out to the western U.S., up in the mountains, in the Sierra Nevada, you know, in uh, Washington State, up in Canada, Alaska, Siberia, Japan, places like that. You need mountains. You need permanent snow fields and glaciers and lava tubes. That's where these ice crawler insects live. And if you were to wander into a, a volcanic uh, snow field and find one of these, if you picked it up and held it in your hand, it would die. It would be too hot for it. They're very specifically adapted to these extreme uh, kind of cool uh, environments. And, and basically what they do is they're scavengers. They're fairly close related to things like earwigs. And if you've ever gone up into the mountains out west, if you take a look down at the snow, and I did this several years ago at Lawson Peak in Northern California, you look down at the snow, there's dead insects all over the place. They get blown in from long distances. So these ice crawlers come out usually at night scavenging for them. So I was out during a day hike looking for them. Didn't see any myself. I talked to my colleague, Dr. Sean Scoville, in our apartment. He happens to be one of the world experts on ice crawlers. He told me, you were in the right spot. I've seen them there. You'd have to go out after dark. Well, it's not the safest thing to wander on snow fields and glaciers after dark by yourself. So um, won't be doing that anytime soon. However, I will say I have seen them live. Again, my colleague, Dr. Scoville, he had some shipped into him at UW-Madison, and he's got a big walk-in freezer in his lab. Remember, these insects needed to be cold, so he had a colony of these, or some of them living, in his freezer. So I have seen a live one, technically on the sixth floor of my building in Madison, but otherwise, their native range is way out west, but very cool insects. But if you think about, um, and we talked about this a couple minutes ago, climate change. I mean, those insects are already stuck in some very sensitive environments, so if those snow fields and those glaciers melt, they're going to lose their home. Do you think that there's ever going to be insects used as a food source for human consumption? Or is it happening now? Well, it, it's, I would say, first off, it, it's happening now, and it has been happening for quite a while. Depends on where you are, though, on the globe. Uh, some parts of the planet and in certain cultures, insects have for a long time been part of their local food source. You go to parts of Africa, for example, or parts of Southeast Asia, um, and people have for long times been consuming insects as a regular part of their diet. Insects don't really come with a nutrition label, but if they did, pretty high in protein, some good fats, some fiber and things like that, they're really pretty nutritious. They're also on a pound-for-pound -pound basis in, in terms of the resources needed to raise them, often you can raise them a lot more efficiently than a pound of chicken or a pound of pork or a pound of beef, for example. So in the U.S., we haven't ever been that keen on eating insects, but there has been a movement, I've noticed, especially the last five, 10 years, to kind of increase awareness of edible mealworms and edible crickets. You do see this starting to pop up more in... Um, everyday life. There are some of the Major League Baseball stadiums that have, you know, fried crickets and, and usually they're seasoned with spices or garlic, things like that. So it, it's starting to catch on to a certain extent. When I look at the direction society is going as a whole, we hear about these days, you know, the uh, impossible burgers and things along those lines. And, and folks are receiving those fairly well. And so in my mind, you know, insects are another protein source. Uh, I would certainly... Uh, eat insects. I, I've tried them. Many of them can be uh, quite good. And what's a little ironic, and I like to remind folks of this when I do my, uh, at various points throughout the year, kind of an Insects 101 lecture that I, I take around the state for various master gardener groups. And when I talk about arthropods in, in general, and arthropods are insects and, and spiders, centipedes and millipedes and related creatures, you know, we're not very keen here on eating insects but if we go to a restaurant, we pay a lot of money to eat shrimp, crabs, and lobsters. Those are also arthropods. The difference is that about 400-ish million years ago, those crustaceans stayed in the ocean, and the shrimp and lobsters and stuff stayed there. 
the ancestor of insects came on land and diversified like crazy. Otherwise, they're very, very closely related in my mind. So um, it is a little bit ironic that we pay a lot of money for lobster, but we won't even think about eating insects because they're, they're pretty close. This is more of an identification question. I know I don't have a specimen for you, but maybe I'll send you a bag of them next summer. Uh, up on Lake Superior, midsummer, July and August, you sometimes have these fairly large host fly like insects that will land on you, sometimes in, by the hundreds. And some people call them fish flies. Some people say they're stable flies that strong south winds have brought up and they hit the cold air and then descend down to the lake shore. <laughs> Just wondering if you know what they are, if you've experienced them. They can bite, but sometimes they're sluggish. I can't hear you. Is it down here? Here, we'll move this for now. Yeah, so I suspect what you bumped into are indeed stable flies. And, and stable flies, um, if you were a, a dairy farmer, or had other livestock, there can be a significant pest um, in terms of attacking, biting livestock. And if your cows are being bitten up, they're not feeding, they're not producing as much milk, that sort of thing. Stable flies, though, can fly very, very long distances, and so we often do see them. I've bumped into them many times myself up on the shore of Lake Superior, in like the Porcupine Mountains or the Apostle Islands, where they kind of get up, they don't want to go out over that open water because that's a long distance for them. Uh, to hit the next bit of land, and so they kind of pile up there, so to speak, and they can make life miserable when they're there and abundant. Um, the repellents don't seem to help against them a whole lot, and one of the best things I've had to do this when I've you know been up on Lake Superior trying to read a book in a, a chair is put a blanket physically over my legs because they specifically tend to like the lower legs. It's usually your ankles that are being bitten up and your arms and, and neck are fine often, um, so that's what it sounds like they are, and they are vicious insects. I'll look around the corner. I've been composting for about 15 years since I've moved here. What, what kind of insects am I uh, enjoying in my compost pile? <laughs> Almost to the end of night. Oh boy, um, insects and compost. You probably have all kinds of cool stuff. Um, as a kid, I loved you know digging through rotting logs and, and things like that. Uh, and my dad probably wasn't very happy, but I used to take a shovel and, and pry up like our, our patio stones and see what was underneath. And you have decomposing soil and stuff like that. All kinds of neat things in there. Um, you are going to have a lot of the kind of recyclers, if you will things that are feeding on decomposing organic plant matter and things like that, starting to break it down. You're gonna have uh, a lot of fly larvae, beetle larvae, including some of our larger beetles in the state. Some of the stag beetles can occur in, in conditions like that, especially if you have a, some larger decaying woody type material in there. Um, gosh, I mean, the diversity of things you could find in there are, are just gonna be mind boggling. Dozens of different families, um, you know. If you had a big, rich, robust uh, compost pile, probably over 100 species if you sat there and, and started looking. And that would be just the insects, and then you have, um, those are the insects feeding on the compost. Then you're gonna have the predators that come in to feed on those insects. You add another layer to the game, and then you're gonna have the parasites of those and so on, so a lot of cool stuff you could find in a case like that. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll end things now. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Sorry. <laughs>